Welcome to the Roundtable Perspective. I'm your host, Tom Roach, and I'm joined by my guest today, Dr. Dennis Barber, to discuss H.P. Lovecraft. Dr. Barber, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. It's always a great opportunity when I can talk about H.P. Lovecraft. Good to have you here. Um, and you have a, a PhD in early American literature, I understand, right? I do, yes. And, uh, and you have an interest in apocalyptic stories and science fiction, and you've been writing about this for years. Um, normally, we talk about you know, something that's been in the news recently or something, but Lovecraft is kind of a, a cult figure, isn't he? He's, not, uh, he's, he's, not, he's influential, but people may not know his name. That's right. A lot of things that uh, come out, I don't believe people connect with H.P. Lovecraft because they don't know him. But uh, the films The Thing, which have been quite popular, uh, which go all the way yeah. back uh, to 1960, I think was the was first one yeah. with James Arness, right. then 82 with Kurt Russell, and then recently yeah. with some uh, art, uh, art actors, I think er somebody Skarsgård was yeah. in it. But uh, the similarities, even though it's not based directly, yeah when Lovecraft's writing are so striking that they're in this isolated northern area like the North Pole and that an alien presence which can uh, change its shape and invade people uh, is yeah. present. And then the dogs, the sled dogs to me are the direct <laughs> really? connection. But most, okay. most people haven't made that point and that's something I'd yeah. sometime like to uh, write on myself. Well, so um, let, let's talk about his style a little bit because he's very, very different from other science fiction writers it seems to me. Um, how would you describe uh, his, his stories? Uh, he is unique in that uh, he mines a field that uh, others have not really mined, which is an unspecified terror. With Edgar Allan Poe and some of the classic writers, you've got yeah. psychological terror of abnormal minds. But with H.P. Lovecraft, you have these alien presences which are so bizarre and so incomprehensible that are you uh, to encounter them it blows your mind. You'll just become a blithering yeah. idiot if you uh, face one of them. And that seems to be uh, a more and more popular theme in, mm -hmm. uh, in film and in, uh, in television. Um, do you, you uh, connect this back a little bit to early American literature in some way, or is, this, is he totally a, going off in a different direction? No, he was a New Englander. And yeah. uh, I think he actually connected himself back to those times because one of his stories, uh, which is called The Dreams in the Witch House, deals with the supernatural element of witchcraft, which of course was unique to the Puritan community oh, yes. around Salem. Right. And so in this story he gives it a whole new spin where this witch and her familiar have the capability of entering a totally different dimension, which is something the Puritans never would have thought of. No. But yes, there is a connection yeah. there actually, which is uh, a long stretch maybe you never would think H.P. Lovecraft and the Puritans, but there is a connection. Yeah. And what about his writing style? What's unique about that? He uh, minds his terror somewhat in the same way as Edgar Allan Poe by using tricks of printing, like italics, all capital letters, many exclamations, many dashes, plus an old-fashioned archaic vocabulary. He uses the word eldritch, which is a word I'd never seen anywhere else. Yeah, I haven't used that in a while. No, I guess not. But it just means these old, uh, very strange, magical rites. So uh, he has a pretty unique style, actually. And um, he's still being read, I assume? Uh, oh, my goodness, I know he's influential, yes. but are people buying his books still? They are. Uh, I teach a science fiction fantasy class, and when they see that we're going to talk about Lovecraft, people just go, oh my gosh, H.P. Lovecraft, and they start throwing in names of stories and incidents from it. And there's a whole cult of his called the Cult of Cthulhu, yeah. who was this unspeakable monster from the ocean that I I've never heard God of knows Cthulhu. where it came from. Uh, he's one of these mind-blowing creatures that's all tentacles and bizarre things, and the Sounds mindset, like the creatures in the thing, the second version of yeah, the Yeah, that's why actually. I think yeah. there is a connection. Yeah. The mindset is so alien to human beings that we can't be in its presence without just being obliterated, uh, physically and also mentally. Yeah, and, uh, and that's a popular uh, theme. It is. <laughs> uh, Lovecraft was on target when he said, the most frightening thing of all is fear of the unknown. And that was the heart of everything he had, is something that can't even be put into words yeah. and can't really be described. Now, actually, he occasionally tried it. Uh, in the little kitchen where he wrote, uh, he sometimes would diagram what some of these creatures might look like on envelopes or old bills. And so one of the more interesting ones is what he calls the elder ones. And these are eight feet tall. 
they're built like barrels. Out of the top of their head, there are tentacles, and on the, their feet, they don't have feet, they have tentacles, and they kind of swish along yeah. the floor. So he drew was, some pictures was he, of those. Uh, was he doing some interesting drugs or something? Or, uh... No, actually it wasn't drugs. What <laughs> okay. it was is his own biography. Yeah. As a child, he lived in a home which was fairly stable. His father was a store owner and his mother was with him and he was quite happy. And then his father lost his business and as a result committed suicide and this horrific trauma and the poverty which ensued from his losing yeah. his business forced the mother to take him to her parents and he lived there very unhappily and he began to experience the most severe of night terrors and that's the source not drugs so he the just night hallucinates terrors, all on his own without yeah he yeah. did and apparently the poor little kid must have been just so <laughs> freaked out and if you ever see a picture of hp lovecraft and i don't believe i have one here in the book with me yeah. it's a very long face very thin face pale haunted eyes uh, he just looks like someone who's always on the verge of being totally freaked right, out. Right. So what was his life like as an adult? Not terribly happy. Uh, he never married. He spent a great deal of time writing his stories and uh, Probably he, no one wanted to be married to someone who was waking up and screaming in the middle of the night. I don't think he right? could have yeah. managed any kind of relationship like right, that. Right. And uh, he often would say, I'm bred to aristocracy, but I have no money at all. So he lived a life of genteel poverty, uh, <laughs> okay. writing his stories and having this tiny little audience of young writers who would read them and say, this is fantastic. Then they would submit manuscripts to him to read and he very generously would read them, write comments all over them, uh, give them all kinds of advice about what to do. And yeah. that's how uh, my article in this uh, particular book is uh, an analysis of that group called the Lovecraft Circle because some of the fantasy that he wrote, these young writers built on it and enlarged it and added characters and mm -hmm. dimensions and he, he approved. He said, that's good. And so uh, he started a whole new generation of fantasy writers. Interesting. Is there a, a university library somewhere that has a collection of Lovecraft materials? Do you, do you have to scour all over for them? or uh, how do you, how do They're you find pretty scattered, but I think probably you'd find them up in New England. Now, he invented a place called Arkham University, and there's an Arkham publishing house. So uh, there is a pretty quick and accessible way to get most of these could, papers. Could I get a degree from this university or is it just... Uh, not Arkham, no. If you did, you'd university. be like one of the characters I in see. here and you'd be in danger because most of them wind up with their minds blown totally by these alien presences yeah. from other dimensions. So um, what, are, what are some of his more famous titles for people that aren't familiar with him? Well, uh, At the Mountains of Madness is the book it's a novelette, it's probably about yeah. 120 pages long, which I feel was the inspiration for The Thing because it has so many yeah. similarities to it. And that's where these barrel-shaped creatures appear, but they also had these gigantic slug-like creatures that when they were roaring through these tunnels sounded like subway trains in New York is the way he described them. Of course. And so uh, that's maybe his most famous one, and I think maybe his best. He has another novel out of about the same length called The Case of Charles Dexter Ward, which again comes back to his Puritan ancestry, where a wizard from the Puritan period uh, comes back as a ghostly presence and uh, uh, he uh, possesses this young man who was a scholar who came to study his life and he keeps staring at his portrait and the wizard eventually takes him over. And uh, the wizard was performing experiments in bringing the dead back to life. But like in most Sounds of these stories, yes. it doesn't work out very well. They come back with no legs or they come back and he can't destroy them. So they're still here after 200 years in these little silo pits, gibbering away, trying to crawl out. So uh, those are two really good ones. His best short story is uh, The Color Out of Space, which is the one that we usually discuss in science fiction fantasy class. And this one he goes to outer space creatures for the horror that he creates. And their spaceship crashes on this little isolated farm in New England. And then there's it, the creature that's living from the spacecraft goes down into this well and somehow poisons everything so that everything becomes mutated and the whole farm becomes this undulating rainbow colored right. monstrosity and all the animals turn into strange freakish creatures and eventually 
the people who live on the farm become monstrous too, to the point where they have to uh, flood the whole area and bury it so that it could never spread any further away. So they're really mind-blowing and extremely uh, creative stories. Because yeah, like, like I like said, fun. he's yeah. unique. He, he comes up with monsters and situations that nobody else seemed to have ever imagined. Now, I remember uh, when I was in high school in the 1960s, you know, the really cool people were reading, carrying around H.P. Lovecraft books. Mm -hmm. I, I, That's I don't right. think I ever had one. But, um, so who's reading him now? Is he popular at this point, or is yes, it just really? Yes, uh, he's very popular. And the students, one, uh, students, yeah. but also scholars in the popular culture yeah. field and specialists yeah. in science fiction. And he fantasy wrote when? Read him. Uh, he was writing in the 1920s and 1930s, and he died in 1937. His life okay. was fairly short. I think he was born about 1895, yeah. so he didn't live very long. Well, the lack of sleep must have contributed. Well, probably to that. that. Yeah. Plus. The fright of just seeing those creatures right. every night finally probably just blew him away. So um, this this book, you, you've got an article on Lovecraft in this book, uh, mm -hmm. Sense of Wonder, published 2011, I think. Yeah. Um, what, what else is in there? What kinds of uh, stories is that? It's, well, it has stories and then, and then critiques of the stories, is that right? Yes, it has both articles on the authors and their stories and other works and also yeah. uh, the original works. The work is extremely comprehensive. It goes back to the beginnings of science fiction fantasy, which almost all anthologies start with Nathaniel Hawthorne, Edgar Allan Poe, and then yeah. carry forward to Charles Dickens what and other classic authors, yeah. and then on into the 20th century with much lesser known and cult figures. Uh, of course, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein is much earlier than that. Is that considered science fiction at all? Yeah, it's usually uh, mentioned, at least, in all science yeah. fiction fantasy books. Yeah categorically different in some way, or is it, uh, is it, is it a forebearer of these other stories? The, the Mary Shelley yes, it, it's a pioneering work, yeah. uh, and uh, so uh, it's often discussed in that way, uh, and yeah. it's set the tone for a lot of the uh, works yeah. that followed. The same idea that these experiments, that scientists playing God try to create life or go into other yeah. dimensions they don't belong in, always turns out very badly for them, uh, was a pattern she established. And of course, in her time, morality was expected. She had to have a moral to the story. Uh, people reading it had to see that the scientist had trespassed into God's territory and he had to be punished. To His be punished. creation uh, was an abor you know, abortive one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then um, that ties in, of course, with the Gothic novels in, in mm -hmm. that period. Is there a relationship between the Gothic uh, literature and Yes, Lovecraft? it's like a tradition, but it uh, evolves as you go along. Because as I said at the beginning, Lovecraft doesn't use either the psychological terror that Poe and right. Hawthorne and others develop, but he doesn't go back to the Gothic horror of clanking chains and ghosts and old haunted castles either. Those had been considered passe for some time. So yeah. he goes into totally new territory. So you can see an evolution in science fiction fantasy of moving away from supernatural yeah. creatures that we're familiar with to uh, unknown terrors and other uh, yeah. Otherworldly things. And he was kind of a pioneer at doing that, I understand, right? Yes, he was. He was quite unique in uh, what he did. And many of it that followed him, that uh, many science fiction readers know better and fantasy readers know better, were inspired by him, and many of them actually gave manuscripts to him to read. Yeah. Uh, Robert Howard is one of these with the Conan series, and uh, many other writers who followed him spun off of things he did, but he yeah. was pretty much the original one of this. Uh, sort of a uh, horror that's undefined and undefinable that comes from somewhere totally different yeah. uh, than you can always account for a ghost or a vampire. They have a, a origin that can be explained, yeah. but these are unexplainable it always, creatures. I always find it unsettling when a, when a story doesn't end with an explanation, but that's, mm -hmm. that's more common today, isn't it? It is, yes. I think a lot of the uh, science fiction fantasy writers want to leave you with that. Like, you have to imagine this. You yeah. have to wrap this up somehow, rather than the old-fashioned way where the uh, character would find out what the ghost needed to make it rest and put it to rest. Or the vampire, you could slay it with the stake. Right. But uh, right. these creatures are pretty much indestructible. Right, and in some cases they just go on. Well, they do. There's being, no way to yeah, get rid of them. Right. And the worst nightmare he had is if 
one of them slipped in from its dimension into ours, it could destroy the entire world because right. it just is more powerful and has no human feelings, right. no human thought process. I, I guess we should have had a warning here. If you have trouble sleeping, you may not want to uh, watch read the rest of the show. Lovecraft. Yeah, yeah, don't read H.P. Lovecraft. <laughs> Um, what, what do you think he'd be worth if he were alive today, given that he kind of pioneered all this stuff? I think he would be a very rich man, because yeah. think of Stephen King. He'd be Stephen King. King, right? Yeah. Well, Stephen King's little wider reading audience yeah. than Lovecraft would have had, but even with the cult, he would yeah. have had, as there were actually, a number of films made. To be honest, none of them are very good. I mean, I've seen many films based on Lovecraft's yeah. work. And most of them just don't ring true. The same is true of Poe. Most of the films made on Edgar Allan yeah. Poe's work are really lame. And they either go very campy or they're so hysterical and over the top that you can't take yeah. them very seriously. So it's yeah. difficult to do it. But honestly, uh, now with the uh, computer graphics, my gosh, they could make the Cthulhu monster. They could make those elder barrel-shaped right. ones. And also, I didn't mention these, but he had some hybrid creatures out of the sea because he lived next to the ocean who are half human, half uh, amphibian who would sometimes come into the town at night and parade through the town Creature making the black funny Lagoon, noises. Right? Yeah. Well, like that, yes. Yeah. And they would try to mate with human beings. So uh, he had a great fear of all of those uh, things that these creatures would just take over and destroy humanity. But uh, he didn't really profit much from any of this, did No, he? he never made any whole lot of money. Of course, there were no movies made on anything he wrote back in his time, and very few people knew his work. And to this day, uh, you know, Stephen King actually does slip into anthologies occasionally, of short fiction or even of American literature. Yeah. And uh, there are all these movies made of his. He's made a fortune off of it. But Lovecraft hasn't made it. And uh, yeah. I would make an argument that he could actually get into an anthology of American Lit as a modern, because uh, even though it's hard to put his name along with T.S. Right. Eliot or Ezra Pound or right. uh, people like that, he still had the same view that modern life was extremely bleak and the most frightening thing about it all is meaninglessness. What if mm -hmm. there is no afterlife? What if yeah. everything we do has no meaning? And in his case, it's like in the face of these monstrosities from another dimension, what are we human beings yeah. uh, except tiny pawns in a huge and dangerous universe that could crash at any moment? So I think he has a good case as being a, a fairly representative modern thinker yeah. in the despair that he feels about modern life. You know, as you're describing that, uh, Herman Hesse's Steppenwolf comes to mind. Mm -hmm. um, it's been a long time since I read that, but do you think there's a there's a, somewhat of a relationship there? There might be, because alienation, I think, yeah. is, that's pretty much the heart yeah. of that novel. Alienation is certainly a part of this. These yeah. characters that he creates are extremely out of touch with the rest of the world. They, they live in a kind of a strange little world yeah. where they're lonely, isolated, much like he was himself. Uh, for yeah. most of his adult life. Well, and the, the, whole, the idea of this all being very inexplicable. You know, um, one film that I thought w was, was based on, uh, on one of his stories, it seems to be, you, you're arguing that it is too, uh, that was really effective though was the original, The Thing, the black and white one. Well, again, yeah. uh, there's no direct connection but, to Lovecraft, but, but there's many, but many similarities. But it certainly leaves you oh, yeah. hanging at the end there. It does. With this it? sense that we're facing some unknown terror. Oh, yes. And I, you know, I, I remember watching that as a kid and it just, it, it, it bothered me for days afterwards. I know. And I've talked to other people out, you know, I'll say, well, you know, what do you think is the scariest movie you ever saw? And these people, you know, they've seen all of it, right? They're, sure. you know, if they're my age and they, you know, half the time people say, you know, there's this black and white movie called The Thing. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, that was funny too, that yeah. James Arness was the Was the thing, the yeah, monster. you never really see his face. Oh, he no. doesn't have a face. He's kind of, a, as I recall, he's actually a big carrot, he's a right? Plant. He's a carrot. Yeah, yeah, like yeah he's some a carrot kind of a plant. Person. You see very glowing eyes and he makes some noises, yeah. you know, and he comes and he's very threatening because he's so tall yeah. and big. But right. no, you can't really tell it was James yeah. Arnaz. He, he did much better as uh, Marshall Dillon. Oh yeah, he was good at school. that. And in all yeah. the old westerns, he was right. good. Right, mm -hmm. Well, so um, uh, you're also interested in um, these apocalyptic uh, films. Oh, I am, yes. Um, do, you, you know, do you think that there's something about our times right now that, that calls for literature like Lovecraft and that, that, that causes us to want to imagine about this apocalyptic future, uh, post-apocalyptic -apoc post future, I guess. 
Yeah, what definitely are your so. On that? Yeah. I did write an article on all the different uh, versions of the thing from the first yeah. novelette, a short novel yeah. written by a guy that uh, was about 100 pages long, and it outlined yeah. the basic plot. And then as it evolved, it's 60 and then 82. Yeah. And then you could see the tenor of the times, you're right. Uh, the times we live in are very troubled yeah. and divisive, and I yeah. think there is fear. Fear is certainly a part, I think, of all of our lives when we look around at what's happening to the environment. For example, yeah. these horrible tornadoes that hit down south near my school, Auburn. They oh, is that right? South yeah. of there yeah. a little bit, killed 23 people. Yeah. And the big forest fires and things make you Mud feel... Mudslides, right. Yeah, helpless, flooding. Yeah. You, you feel like you could be victimized by these horrible, powerful forces, which right. are unknowable. And he starts writing after World War I, and World War yeah. I was, you know, often described as the most horrific experience oh, yes. in history at that point, right? Right. Uh, mustard gas and... Uh -huh. uh, yeah. air raids and things like that. Right? Yeah, well, troubled times, I think, lead us to think about apocalyptic things, like, yeah. is this the end? Are we really headed towards something like this with yeah. polar ice caps melting and all the things we're seeing, extreme weather yeah. patterns and bizarre incidents going on? Are yeah. we headed towards some apocalypse? So I right. think in times like that, such literature really catches hold. Um, I think at the end of the thing, doesn't it end with a radio broadcast and is that the one where the where the the, the broadcaster saying keep watching the skies or something? Is that you know there is a version like that of the 1982 one with Kurt Russell, which yeah. ends with the two guys. They're the last two survivors, and yeah. neither is sure the other hasn't been possessed by the alien right, creature, right. and so they're just going to sit there and freeze. But that won't kill the aliens, so you're left hanging in the air. But that's when the voiceover comes in and said, "Watch the skies yeah. and this because this could happen. That the whole world could be." decimated yeah. in, I think it was less than a year if such an alien creature came in and took it, yeah. over. And if you would uh, compare that to something like a, a plague, like a biological yeah. thing or biological warfare, right. then you can see why or people Or a zombie epidemic, in. you know, well, right, there are lots of yeah. zombie epidemic Oh, definitely. Stories, They've yeah. become very popular yeah. in the last few years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so what about zombies? I mean, how do they fit into this? Why are we fascinated with zombies? What's your thoughts on that? I don't really know. I've never been quite that <laughs> not a taken guy? with them myself. No, no, I'm not. But I do remember the first zombie film I ever saw, which, like you were talking about the yeah. uh, original thing, I was in college, and I walked up to one of the old-fashioned theaters in Terre Haute yeah. near the campus, and they were showing Night of the Living Dead, yeah. which is this very low-budget film also black with no and white, known yeah. actors, black and white, yeah. and that was frightening. And here are these people who had been revived by this ray from outer space are reviving, and they're starving and cannibalistic, and they attack everyone. Yeah. Uh, and, and not much of an explanation. No. The uh, ending was what troubled me the most, because you had this heroic black guy who had done everything right and fought off the zombies, right. and it looked like he was going to survive. And then survive. racism comes up, right? Well, it wasn't that so much. Yeah. It, it, well, it could be that that yeah. was what was behind it, but yeah. anyway, he hears real people coming who are shooting the zombies. Yeah. You just have to shoot them through the head and they're right. done for. Yeah. Those and they're were easy shooting them all down. Them. And uh, he sticks his head out the window to yell for help and they think he's a zombie and shoot him. I thought, oh yeah. no, yeah. this is the ending? He was supposed to be saved. There was yeah. supposed to be hope. Yeah. And instead he gets killed. So to me, that was a really shocking film. But since then, I always look at the zombies and they vary them. But what gets me about them is the same thing I, that used to get me about the mummy. He's creeping along. And right. Oh my gosh, he's going to get some heck. Oh, he's going like tripping. a half a mile yeah. an hour. Yeah. And the same with the zombies. They're wobbling along. Yeah. And well, if you get caught, it's your own fault. <laughs> you can't move faster than those so things. So that's, that's Dennis Barber's advice to yeah, those of you who are worried about fan. this. Yes. If you're a zombie fan, I apologize. Yeah. No, that's, that's good. Mm -hmm. um, so. You know what's coming next? What you know? What are we going to be interested in next? Do you have any thoughts about that? How do you I how really do you get strange know. past this point? You know. What? Yeah, uh, that requires somebody like Lovecraft, who has a yeah. vision, who's original, who comes in with something like Poe did. Like this is a new way of telling it. I'm not yeah. really using supernatural. I'm using 
abnormal psychology, which is more horrifying yeah. than a ghost or a vampire. Yeah. So I don't really know. I think Stephen King has run out of tricks. All the books he's written, he's begun to repeat and re just yeah. vary yeah. plots slightly. So it isn't going to be from him. Yeah. So I don't really know. I look at new anthologies of these and new writers, yeah. in them, but I don't think anybody's quite found it. And I couldn't tell yeah. you what it's going to be. Well, maybe we've mined that. You know, we might have, that, though uh, uh, you might have thought that too when Lovecraft came along. Well, it's all been yeah. worked out, it's all been done, and then he opened a whole new uh, avenue. Right. Well, so I don't know we'll what see it if is, we're surprised. but I think we might. Yeah, I think we could be. That's all the time we have for our program. Thank you to Dr. Dennis Barber for joining me today on the Roundtable Perspective. I'm Tom Roach. See you next time.